Let's rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, again, welcome. Thanks for joining us at, uh, at Leonard. It's good to see everybody. Mr. McDevitt, thanks for having us out. It's nice to be back in, uh, in the schools. Okay. Um, Mary, could you take attendance for me? Absolutely. Acting President Griffith. Here. Secretary Hanser, present. Trustee Schaefer. Here. Trustee D'Alessandro. Here. Trustee Foster. Here. Thank you, Mary. Mr. Weaver, any changes to the agenda tonight? Uh, none tonight. Thank you. Okay, we've got um, <clears throat> the consent agenda containing the minutes of the September 13th regular meeting, the, thir the September 13th closed meeting, and August bills payable. Can somebody put that motion on the table? Eric? Move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Support. Support. Support, Dan. Any discussion? No, no discussion. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. Passes. Thank you. Okay. Prearranged request to address the board. Mr. Uh, Mr. McDevitt, you're up. I'd like to welcome everybody to Leonard Elementary School. Uh, as you said, Mr. Griffin, it's been a long time since we've had the board meetings at, in the schools, and it's good to have, have everybody back and get to talk a little bit about some of the things that are going on here at Leonard. <clears throat> I want to share with you some of our school goals this year. Uh, our main goal is to promote positive youth development socially, emotionally, and of course academically. And the way we are looking at doing that this year is by focusing on the culture and the climate of our school. Our three main goals to achieve this is we've, uh, we're looking at increasing our social, emotional support and education through having a full-time family school liaison in our building. Uh, that person will be delivering weekly <coughs> social emotional learning uh, classroom lessons. Uh, you know, implementing listening circles in our classrooms and within our staff meetings and increased counseling. Um, a big school initiative this year for us is our positive behavior intervention and supports. That's also commonly referred to as PBIS in the schools. And it's a school-wide program to promote uh, positive behavior. Um, and then something we started last year, but we are really uh, diving into it even more this year, is what we call our What I Need or Win Time for all students. Um, this is where trained interventionists provide support to students based on assessment data. We give the entire school, kindergarten through fifth grade, screener assessment, look at that data, find students that might need even more um, diagnostic type of assessment where we look in to see what the um, underlying issue of their struggle could be. And then we set up a, a program of intervention for them um, and that happens every day, almost like a special schedule. They have music time, PD, they also have this intervention time. For those students who are um, higher achieving, it provides enrichment activity plan for them. Points of pride. Uh, being so early in the year in September, we haven't really done a whole lot yet this year, but I want to talk a little bit about some stuff that happened last year. Uh, we had our IV reauthorization team um, from 
around the, the world, actually from Canada, Brazil, uh, came and, and worked with our, our school and our team to uh, really dig into what we're doing out here. And we received a glowing review from the IP reauthorization team during their trip in April. In our closing meeting with them, uh, Rita Van Stepper and, and myself, uh, our IP coordinator, um, got to listen to what they had to say, and they had told us that this was one of the best visits that either one of them had ever conducted, uh, was what they saw in our school. We took notes on some of the things they said, and they said, you have a deep understanding of inquiry, it was witnessed in every class, students problem solve and share their thinking. Students have multiple ways of agency and learning is fun. We enjoy the soft start looking different in each grade. Students and teachers were well versed in the language of IB, their planners, and their program of inquiry are strong. Great submission of the paperwork. Students learn at their own way and their pace. There's great intervention and support in this school. And like I said, last year we were just starting the win time, and they really thought that was something that was fantastic. They loved the win time. They liked how the students had voice in their learning. Um, our third graders were doing a passion project. So while some students were getting um, intervention in the wind time, some of the other students in their enrichment activity was what we call a passion project, where it was like a mini exhibition for third grade. Students picked their own topics, did their own research on it, and did their own presentations in the classroom. Um, and they thought it was a great preparation for an exhibition. The students shared how Leonard was a special place to be their parent interviews, they found that parents are super happy. Um, the system connection support from the governing body, which is the board, super good all the way down. Um, support from the IB coordinator. The classroom setups have character and comfort. In a lot of our classes, we have flexible seating, so instead of walking in and seeing rows of desks, you might not see any desks. You know, see beach balls and bean bags and different ways of, of making students feel comfortable and have some choice in their learning. Classroom displays uh, had learning and connection to the content. Teachers, students, principal, coordinator, parents are positive to that. So we had a, a really good IP reauthorization. Um, and then I just wanted to share some, some pictures of some of the things that we started off with the school year. Uh, first days of school. And we had our fifth grade camp this year in September. It was beautiful weather. Both days we were out there at Echo Grove right here in Leonard. And the kids had a fantastic time. And it was really nice doing it at the beginning of the year because the kids get a chance to bond with each other right off the bat. Thank you. It's going to be a great year. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions, comments from the board? Dan. Paul, how, how many students do we have now out in, uh, roughly in, in Leonard? About 300. About 300? Okay. And then um, we're going to add the, F, the FSL, or we have the FSL. How many, um, when we do these assessments, how many people look into those assessments? Like what's so we, the team look like? We have a, a team of probably six or seven, um, including the classroom teachers. This is what also drives our IRIPs, our mm -hmm. uh, reading intervention plans, our uh, third grade reading law requirements. We do that for all students. So that data is looked at by our reading specialists, our interventionists, myself, classroom teachers. Okay. And, and, and so I, I want to make sure that we all understand what the assessment for the that the students are taking it's not it's it's a um, social emotional assessment correct if there's emotional issues there it's not a psychological test or is it there's there's a variety of tests there is a social emotional screener called savers which is part of okay and that's that's not the students taking the test that's more of the teacher observations Self. going through it, like a, an assessment for that but when I was talking about the wind time, it's more of an academic type test. We use fast bridge and we test reading and math in a screener. And it's a nationally normed um, assessment that just kind of looks at their grade level and where they are. That flags certain kids. And we look at those that are now in the bottom 30% of that. And then we take those students and we give them a more diagnostic type test, like our phonics and now reading assessment, where a teacher sits down one-on-one -on -one and reads with them, listens to the student read, and takes data on that. And that pinpoints more is the student's problem with accuracy, 
phonetics, uh, comprehension, so we know what type of interventions to provide for that student. And we do the same yeah. with math. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Any other questions? Mary. Make a comment. Thank, thank you so much for having us. It's really great to be back um, in the schools, and thank you for the uh, cider and donuts. I always appreciate that. Um, the um, I was really interesting to hear about the passion projects. I'm thinking about how the kids. It's getting the kids excited too. You know, for exhibition, like you know, one of those uh, rites of passage. You know, here in Oxford. What were some of the uh, projects that the students came up with? So. It's difficult to do something like that if you don't have like a win time schedule. And the win time provides that time where some students are getting help in, in math, some students are getting help in reading, some students are um, you know, working in, in their writing, and the teacher has a few students left in the classroom where they get to do these kind of projects. So this was done in third grade in Mrs. Lane's class. And students picked a variety of things. Um, you know, some of them were uh, passionate about football and wanted to research you know, how football got started and when did the Super Bowl era start and things like that. Uh, some students you know, took out a little more you know, classic kind of uh, problems in the environment and uh, you know, electric vehicles versus gas vehicles and things like that where they were just doing some research on their own and then they had to put together a little slideshow presentation to give to those students and get them to the class. Thank you. Anything else? <clears throat> Paul, I've had in the past I've had an um, opportunity to sit in on those reauthorization calls, and there's such a great opportunity to to share with with the IB organization the things that that we're doing, and hear back from them, you know, what they've experienced, what they've seen from us, and it, you know, it, it it feels like a great affirmation about the things that that are going well so I'm, I'm glad to hear I'm glad to hear that your visit went well and and I, like Mary said thanks again for <laughs> for having us out thank you Paul okay let's go ahead and move into section five unscheduled audience participation uh, let's take a take a quick break We'll take a few minute break and then uh, we'll get started. I don't know if the I don't know if that microphone is is working. So if you could just which which one is this one working? Right? That sounds good. Let's okay. use that one. All right. My name is Shirley Tomzak. I have a long history with Leonard School, but I won't go into that. But I have a question tonight. I want to know um, how what what's the transparency for uh, filling the vacancies that are on the board. How, how informed are we going to be um, about who is applied and who you're interviewing and how you make your choice? I think you should answer that, yeah. So we'll, we'll later on in the agenda tonight, We'll be talking through those. We won't. We won't list every name that's that's applied, but we will be talking through 
the things that we like. Um, until we've made our decision, we'll refer to everybody as, as numbers. And then we'll, once we've determined who those folks are that we want to talk with further, we'll announce those names and invite them back. How long? What? When do you see that? Ha when do you see that happening? Oh, I, I don't have an exact date, but we need to do this quickly. We've only got a, a, a couple more weeks, really. And what happens to the position that Corey had? I know it's up in December, so the person who fills that position is done in December? Yeah. You know, Chad, what we might want to do is just when we come to that part of the agenda, yeah. we'll explain it all then. Yep. Okay. So we don't have to, so we don't do a question and answer. Yep, that's fine. Or a comment. Good. Thank you. Thank you. We can just explain everything, you know, when we start the process. Um, Amanda. Oh, thank you, Mary. Yep. So, sorry, real quick before you get started, um, we will. I can't really show it because it's already on the timer. Okay, so we've everybody's got three minutes to speak, and when the when you get down to how does it work? I don't know this new system. When we start the white light, will go on. Okay. Um, and then the timer's working. When you have one minute left, the orange light in the middle goes on, and when you're at the end of the three minutes, the red light will go on, and it makes a beep. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Thanks. Man. Working on technology. <laughs> Thanks to the team. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the board's response to much of the information that has come out since November 30th has been, we didn't know. While I can absolutely see that being the case, I implore you to find out where the information is stopping before it reaches you. Is it the legal team? Is it internal? Is it both? There are a few things that I want to bring to your attention. First, Threat Assessment Policy 8400 was adopted in 2004 and was in place on November 30th. 8400 states that a threat assessment team shall be in place which consists of five members. The district failed before it even started here, as I can find no evidence that a team was ever in place. This policy states that the process of threat assessment should be consistent with the Secret Service model. That model says that these teams should not only meet every time a concerning behavior has been brought to their attention, but should also meet on a regular basis so that every member is aware of their responsibilities. Again, I can find no evidence that this ever happened in the 17 years it was adopted as policy. Who was responsible for policy implementation? The Secret Service model provides markers to consider during step four of whether to involve law enforcement. One such marker is behavior involving weapons and violence and should be immediately reported to law enforcement. This text is outlined in bold, obviously relaying its significance. It also notes the importance of checking the student's belongings. In addition, the model goes on to point out other concerning markers that should trigger a thorough assessment. Some of these include inappropriate interest in weapons, mass attacks, or other types of violence, access to weapons, evidence of desperation, hopelessness, or suicidal thoughts, stressful events, and whether others are concerned about the student's statements or behaviors. Clearly, we heard that one teacher was so concerned that she not only emailed counselors multiple times, she went back through student assignments. If, like me, that was the first time that you all heard of this account, I again implore you to find out where the information is stopping within the system. I cannot fathom that this teacher cared so much to go above and beyond that she has not told anyone in this district this account until now. Speaking of teachers, did you know that Guidepost posted on their website 15 days ago asking anyone with information to schedule an interview for October 12th, 13th, and 14th? Has the district relayed this information to all stakeholders, including teachers, so that those with information are encouraged to participate? Lastly, I noticed that the district utilizes a program called Sabers, which gives student surveys related to their social and emotional well-being. I couldn't find much info given to parents regarding this program, so I went directly to their website. According to their website, this program provides the district with reports showing risk for behavior problems. Reports are made available at the class and individual student level. What has the district used these reports for? Where is the data? Was there or is there currently a procedure in place to identify troubled children? If concerning responses are registered, is there a follow-up with individual students? And lastly, did Ethan and his class take this survey? Thank you. Thank you.
Daniel. Am I using this? Sure, thank you. It's on? Yep. Uh, good evening. Um, here we are again, 10 months. 10 months in zero accountability from this board, from the administration. Since December of 2021, parents, teachers, community members, students, we've demanded honesty, transparency, and corrective action. And here we are, still asking for it. I want to share and actually echo some of Amanda's facts. Let's go back to January of 2021. Homeland Security produced an awareness bulletin for local communities, raising awareness on potential risk factors and indicators for targeted violence in schools. A warning shared with us. They reinforced the prevention of targeted violence should remain a key goal of schools and communities. How did Oxford respond to this? Well, in the January 2021 board meeting, there was no mention of it. February, one board meeting, you talked about core key replacements of all buildings. That was the safety update. March, two board meetings, nothing. April, two board meetings, COVID update. May, two board meetings, COVID update. June, you updated 8,400 school safety information policy, which includes the threat assessment and intervention procedures. The board authorizes the superintendent to create a building level trained threat assessment team. Each team is head by the principal and includes a counselor, school psychologist, instructional personnel, and where appropriate, an SRO. You implemented the policy, but you did not execute. My understanding is training has not occurred since 2018, up until recently. June 2021, one board meeting, COVID update. July, four board meetings, no safety updates. August, two board meetings, safety update on COVID. September, two board meetings, one COVID update. October, three board meetings, not one safety update. November, we know November was critical. Threats, deer head incident on November 4th. Parents concerned, board meeting, November 9th, nothing, nothing. November 23rd board meeting, despite the bird head incident, despite the threats, the social media countdown that may have come from another state, doesn't matter, nothing. We had a head of safety, Jill Lamont, who is no longer with us for a year before this tragedy, no safety updates. On threat assessments, Alice training, nothing. They occurred the year before when safety was under Mr. Barna, who's our finance lead. We praised her on her exit last week. <clears throat> praised her. No safety updates. We know the threat assessment policy guidelines were not in place. We know they were not. We don't need guideposts for that. They were not in place. A team was not in place. I begged for the guidelines for 10 days. 10 days, I got them three days before Jill left. I met with Tom and Corey and shared all this information with them. Shared 8410A, 8410B. How do we get to choose which ones, which is the right path? How do we choose 8410A on that day? If, if a threat assessment had been done, it would have been B. It's written in black and white. We don't need guidepost. We don't need a criminal investigation. We don't need civil lawsuits for this. Accountability resides with the board, resides with the superintendent, resides with the principal. You teach our kids accountability. Take a look at yourselves as well. Let's show what Oxford Strong looks like. Let's take accountability. Thank you. <clears throat> Jennifer. My name is Jennifer Roop and I'm a parent and a teacher in Oxford Schools. And I would like to share my support for the Oxford School Board. 
and for the district. Being on the school board is a thankless job, even in the most best of times. Now, in a time of crisis, I cannot only imagine the countless hours, the worry, the hard work that has become a part of your daily lives, much beyond the norm. I have not spoken publicly until now, because for me, it feels like you often couldn't support the school and support the victims at the same time. And I don't believe that to be true. For me, as the saying goes, love wins. And so I support you and thank you for your service. And I apologize if it has not been loud and clear from me until now. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay. Um, moving on to Board of Education matters. Um, so we've got in the wake of the resignations, we've got some reorganization to do. So the I've, for the last couple of weeks, I've been acting president. Um, I'm, I'm respectfully going to decline remaining in this position. Um, I've spoken to each member of the board and to Ken um, over the last week, so this decision is, is no surprise to them. Um, what I want to relay to the community um, is that my decision is, is, is personal and it's in no way indicative of uh, wavering commitment. It is no way signifying that I am any less committed to the community, to the, to the staff, and to the kids. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, okay, so I guess let's let's go for it. We've got a number of, of um, motions on the agenda. I make a motion. <clears throat> Heather. Um, I move to nominate that Dan D'Alessandro be nominated for the position of president for the remaining year of the 2022 calendar year. Thank you, Heather. Support? Eric? Support? Any discussion? No discussion? Well, I, can I just clarify something just so the public knows? So when you're sure. filling a position of somebody who has resigned, you're finishing their term? Just like a regular well, no, school year? Be, Which, until the end of the year. Until the end of the year, that's right. what I mean. Th that, their oh, cycle no, of that position. Mm -hmm. Got it. The, okay, good. Thank you, Heather. Okay, Any anything else? Mary, do you want to take us through a roll call vote then? Sorry, I went to chat. Yeah. I said it. Ms. Schaefer? Yes. Mr. D'Alessandro? Yes. Mr. Foster? Yes. Ms. Hanser? Yes. Mr. Griffith? Yes. Which seat? So I guess so this can be the best Well, first, I'd like to thank this board um, for the support, and more importantly, I'd like to thank um, 
I'd like to thank Ken and Cabinet for bringing me as up to speed as we possibly could be because I know there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And that's not an indication of Tom or, or anybody else. That's just we're getting into the nitty gritty right now and we're going to have a lot of information coming our way. And um, we're going to make sure that that we do our very best and that we make sure that uh, when the community brings something to our attention that we do everything we can do to make sure that it gets addressed. Um, so let's uh, continue and I'll save my further thoughts for later. Uh, we also have to appoint a treasurer so there's a motion that needs to be read. Uh, Chat. Get to check my name. Uh, I move that Heather Schaefer be nominated for the position of treasurer for the remainder of the 2022 calendar year. I support. Support Ms. Hanser. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, we do roll oh, call. Oh, I'm sorry, roll call vote. See, it's been a while, sorry. Ms. Schaefer? Yes. Mr. D'Alessandro? Yes. Mr. Foster? Yes. Ms. Hanser, yes. Mr. Griffith? Yes. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, a motion for board parliamentarian for the remainder of the 22 calendar year. Anybody like to make a motion on that? Yeah. Mr. Mr. Griffith? Yeah, Dan, I'm going to... Um, I move that uh, Dan D'Alessandro be nominated for the position of board parliamentarian for the remainder of the 2022 year. Is there, is there support for that? I'll second it. <laughs> Mary? Uh, discussion. I, I guess I, I have. How do you feel about that? I, well, I have a question on that. Um, that gives an awful lot of responsibility to one person and. I just want to make sure that the board is 100% satisfied in that. Um, I think the board needs to be a group discussion, although parliamentarian is just how our meetings flow. Uh, I don't want it to seem like there's one person with more mm -hmm. positional power than anybody else. This is a board. All decisions are made by the board, not by one civic person. So as long as everybody's right. okay with that, I would be all right. The, the the reason I put your name there because I know you've filled that position at times in the past. I, I appreciate what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Okay. And it's it's a short period. And yeah. I think our next sitting board will have to really get up to speed quickly on those procedures. So. Right. Okay. And I mean I can I'll help support you. Okay. <laughs> you know I will. Oh, I, I will ask you. Okay. Roll call vote, please. Team. Uh, Ms. Schaefer? Yes. Mr. D'Alessandro? Yes. Mr. Foster? Yes. Ms. Hanser? Yes. Mr. Griffith? Yes. All right. Item B, bank depositories. Um, traditionally, it is set for the treasurer. So there is a motion on the table. Anybody want to? Mary, you want to read that motion? I shall. Move that all general fund and debt retirement checks for the 2022 calendar year be listed and approved by the board. They will be signed by using the signature plate engraved with the names of Kenneth B. Weaver and Heather Schaefer. Support. Support Chad. Any discussion? Roll call vote, please, Mary. Ms. Schaefer? Yes. Mr. D'Alessandro? Yes. Mr. Foster? Yes. Ms. Hanser? Yes. Mr. Griffith? Yes. Okay. And then we also have a um, motion for action on internal accounting. Anybody want to? Eric, Eric please. <clears throat> Move that all payroll, internal accounting, and school lunch checks be signed 
for the 2022 calendar year by using the plate engraved with the name with the names Kenneth B. Weaver and Heather Schaefer. Do I have support? Support Chad? Any discussion? Roll call vote, please. Ms. Schaefer? Yes. Mr. D'Alessandro? Yes. Mr. Foster? Yes. Ms. Hanser? Yes. Mr. Griffith? Yes. Okay. That takes care of that, those items. Now we have um, review applications for board member vacancies. We have one more. Oh, sorry. I skipped right by it. Uh, the final recommendation, Mary. Move that the board president will be allowed to sign checks in place of board treasurer only when and if needed. Support. Support Chad. Any discussion? Mary I did, oh. Sorry, Dan, just, just one note. Yep. This is a new um, a new motion that we're that we're putting in place today. Um, basically with Corey resigning, we found that we needed we need an, an avenue to allow the president to sign checks in the event that something has to get signed before we can name a new treasurer. So that's what that's what this one is covering. Okay. All right. Roll call vote, please. Ms. Schaefer? Yes. Mr. D'Alessandro? Yes. Mr. Foster? Yes. Ms. Hanser? Yes. Mr. Griffith? Yes. All right, now review applications for board members, vacancies. So, yes. So having done this a couple different times, um, I, I will say that this is probably the most in-depth that we have gone into filling a vacancy. Uh, and I'm proud to say we had over 20 applications. Uh, all very, very proud that our community is taking an interest in our board. Um, so the process is we'll discuss by a number system because one of the, one of the questions that we had on the um, application was do you want your application to be public or private some had public some had private so we're going to use a numbering system just out of respect for those that chose to have a private um, application and uh, those numbers will be discussed at which point we will um, interview the people that we want to bring forward um, now understanding we have 30, by law, we have 30 days to fill the position. So we would have 30 days to fill Tom's and then slightly thereafter we had, what, maybe about a week? Nine yeah, months. just a few days. A few days before Corey. So we'll, we'll basically what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to take all these applications and they indicated if they wanted to fill the Tom's position or Corey's position or if they would choose to, to fill either one. So we took all that information and we're going to do it with one, um, one set of interviews rather than interview for one and then take a break and then interview for the other one. We're gonna to try to find the two best people based on their criteria for what seat they wanna sit and, and, and what, we, what we desire um, for our position. It's a short window for the uh, one replacing Corey uh, it's until the end of this fiscal or this calendar year. Tom's would be through 2024, so December 31st, 2024, is when Tom's seat was vacated. Right. So I want to be really clear because I think there was some information out there about who picks this, who selects it. It's not the governor. It's not anybody. It's the people that are the remainder of the board. We have different ways that we can go about filling it. We could appoint, we could interview, and then appoint. We feel it's best to get all the information that we can, talk to the people that are interested, and then make our selection from there. So without any other conversation, just, we'll, again, just use the numbering system. Do you all have the sheet in front of you? Mm -hmm. Of the yes. numbers, or you have the, yes. your numbers? All right, I have, 
I guess what we'll do, Mary, is why don't you go ahead and jot down the, uh, the numbers and then we'll start with Eric if you give us your numbers, that, the people that you would like to interview and then um, we'll go from there. We'll go Mary, we'll go Eric, Mary, Heather, Chad, myself. So, so I selected three. One, two, and sixteen. Yeah. Okay. I selected one, nine, thirteen, and sixteen. I can barely hear you guys. Can you, can you hear me? Sorry. I can hear you, but I could not my mic was barely hear you guys. Yeah, guys. Sorry. You want to go ahead and say yeah. yours again, Eric? Sorry. I selected one, <coughs> two, and sixteen. And Mary? I selected 1, 9, 13, 16. Heather? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were waiting no, on I... me. I selected 1, 9, 11, and 14. Had um, one, two, and sixteen. Go ahead. I apologize. I left one out for my list. That's okay. Um, I had number two on my list also. All I right. apologize. That's okay. I, I'd like to add that. Yep, I wanted to add that one too. I'm sorry. I'm looking at my. I got to name my glasses on. <laughs> It tends to happen when we get over a certain age. Sorry. <laughs> I have mine. Uh, l <laughs> let me repeat my selection so it doesn't Please. seem non transparent. 1, 2, 9, 11, and 14. Okay. And then, Mary, you also Sorry. had the addition of 2. Correct? I had 1, 2, 9, 13, 16. All right. That's what I have. Okay. You have, you have Chad's? Uh, one, 1, 2, 16. Okay. Yeah. I have one, two, and eleven. Okay. I just want to make a couple comments too. Yes. Um, too, I know, I know, um, Mrs. Tomzak. I wanted to make sure I covered everything. Um, if an applicant. A couple things that would make them not meet the criteria is they have to they have to live in district. That's a per state guidelines. They have to live in the district of the school to be on the school board. So if any applicants applied that were not, they would not be applicable. And then um, they are not allowed to also work for the district and be on the school board. So I just wanted to clarify that too. Heather, is that per our policy or is that state guideline? Well, a little bit of both. Okay. Really. And both kind of cover both. Yeah, and and because Mary and I spoke briefly one time about another thing that she had pointed out, so I want to make sure that she gets hers covered. Mary. Yeah, that you do have to be a registered voter in the school district. It's more than just living in the district. You have to be a registered voter in the district. Okay. And, and that is per state law. And that is per state law. Okay. So once we bring our candidates forward, we will have to make sure that they fit those criteria. Um, and then once that is done, we will go ahead and interview them. So I would say anybody that has more than three, we should interview. They don't have to be four, because three would be the, well, but we have, three would um, be a majority of this board. Yeah. So we have two people that each have five, and we have one person that has three. The remainder are two or less. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and take the, um, what numbers were, were five? Number one had five, number two had five, number 16 had three. Okay. So I will, at the end of this meeting, contact one, two, and 16, make sure they fit that those uh, bylaws and the state guidelines and uh, set up a 
interview date per our timeline. Okay, and we will have those names posted once they accept the um, once they accept the interview. We will post the, their names on the school district's website. All right, and we will try to have that. Let's see, today's Tuesday. We'll try to have that by Thursday. Thank you. And thank you all for taking the time to read these. Um, as I said in the past, it was maybe one or two. And so this is a, this really gives you a good understanding of the, of the uh, talent in our district and our parents. And uh, we should be pretty proud that 20 people wanted to serve. A lot of qualified. Especially, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that there was not one that wasn't a qualified person. So. Um, Let me just repeat again. We're interviewing 1, 2, and 16. Yes. Okay. Does anybody feel very strongly on another candidate that you want to make a, a uh, la one last pitch to the board? Because sometimes we pick up things differently. Heather? Um, in, in my notes, candidate number 16 turned in their intent to apply late. The, do I have the wrong notes or am I correct? Because to me, if we're going to have, you know, if all applicants have to have their letter intent by 3 o'clock on a certain day, then that... Um, I mean, if that's if that's what we posted, I think that's what we should stick to. Yeah. We posted it multiple times. Would anybody times. object to that? So, but maybe I got my notes mixed up. I mean, I got. I a, have it right here. I got a lot of people. So. I have the time right here, and it is after the time requirement. So, to me, that candidate would not be able to move forward. I would think unless, unless, um, I would think unless there was some. Um, record that it was sent maybe not received in the same amount of time so i don't know if you can tell you know what i'm saying i'm like i would hate for yeah. it okay okay call luck somebody's server but so what i will do then is i will sent. reach out to who collected these make sure that it, the time stamp is the time stamp and right like can we tell when yep. it was actually by somebody else and I don't know I, I'm just okay. I'm putting it out there because the time was close that was all okay it was close I will I will uh, verify that and I will um, I will let y'all know okay is there anybody else on there that we feel as though would want to put in there I think that would be that would be it okay it was just one vote, I think, for everybody else. So, okay, I will. Uh, we'll move on. And I think we kind of. Yeah. I understand where y'all want me to do on with number sixteen. So we'll make sure that, that happens either yeah. today or tomorrow. Okay. All right, moving on. Um, item number seven: curriculum and instruction. Ms. Conja Collins and Mr. Wolf. Uh, good evening. Uh, we wanted to. Uh, in the elementary uh, curriculum, and this happens to be at our Oxford Virtual Academy. And Calico Spanish is an elementary uh, new set of series of courses and a vendor as well, which provides those courses. So to share a little bit more about that, I want to invite on Mr. Steve Smith, who is our OBA um, Director of Share Time and Program Development, to discuss a little bit more of the curriculum. Can you get a mic maybe so they can be recorded? Yes. Uh, where is that? Is the mic right there on the podium? I thought it would be sure folks watching can hear what you have to say. There you go. It's good. Sorry. Hello. Good evening, board. I'm Christy Smith, the Director of Shared Time for the District. Um, I'm here tonight to present Calico Spanish as a new vendor for elementary Spanish courses. Um, currently, OVA uses two different vendors for elementary Spanish. One is Middlebury, and the other is FlexPoint, which is formerly known as Florida Virtual. 
Um, both of those are good vendors, good classes, um, but they're geared a little bit more toward upper elementary and require students to actually know how to read and work independently to be successful in those classes. So um, we've found Calico Spanish, which is designed specifically for lower elementary students. And um, I actually had different slides that aren't up here, but um, in your board packet you have more information with the scope and sequence. Um, there's four levels currently and they're working on level five, so there's levels A, B, C, D with Calico. And um, all of these classes align to the ACTFL standards, which is the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages. And these are the same standards in which our other classes also already align. Um, so in order to make this content work well for online students, um, we're looking at getting it into our Buzz LMS platform and um, embedding all of the videos there so the students don't have to go out to various websites. That's important for very young students, that it's all in one place. So um, this curriculum's video-based. There's a lot of songs and games and um, images and things that are really engaging for younger students. Um, we're also taking the printable worksheets and turning them into online interactive activities so young students don't have to try to take pictures of worksheets and upload, which is kind of a difficult skill for someone who's maybe four or five years old. Um, let's see. We also, one of the most important things is taking any text and putting little audio clips next to it. So if a student can't read yet, they'll still be able to independently go through the course by clicking next to the text and hearing it read to them. Um, in terms of price, it's very affordable. Right now they have a per teacher cost and um, instead of most of our courses are per student enrollment. So the per teacher cost is $329 for the year and then there's a $2,000 fee to purchase the rights to embed their content in our LMS. So overall it's very cost effective. So I don't know if we do questions or if I turn it back over to Mr. Wolf. Any questions? Chad? Thanks, Dan. Yeah, not, not so much a question, but um, I, I was reading through the, the packet and I really liked the way it breaks it breaks the lessons down um, per grade level. Um, I, I'm embarrassed to say that I, I, I took Spanish in high school and in college, and, and I would probably be at the lowest level right now. But but I let, but but the way that but the way your slides presented, I think it, it was it was very helpful to, to see the way that all that was functioning. So thank you, appreciate thank that. You. Anybody else? Mary. Um. It's interesting, uh, the things that I just hadn't thought about, about embedding these things on our own server so people aren't going all these different directions. I mean, that's a great um, cybersecurity feature also. So people aren't, we aren't having people with our, with district um, hardware possibly wandering around other places in the internet. Um, so that's a great security feature. Um, I think it's worth the investment, you know, for our families and for our servers too, you know, and our equipment. So I think that's really, um, I never, I never thought of that before. So thank you. One of the things that I've always hoped for from our foreign language courses I always thought, well, it would be, you know, it's nice to be able to write into the language and be able to form a sentence, but I think really what would be the best thing is if we could take a student, drop them in the middle of Mexico, and have them get themselves back home. That's really how you learn the language. I mean, that that is, it's practical use. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm, we're getting closer and closer to it. And this, uh, looking through the packet, it shows some of those building blocks to get us there. So thank you. All right, thank you. Mr. Wolf, good. All right. I wouldn't even get past, I barely get to the airport, let me tell you. Item number eight, 
Business and Maintenance, Mr. Barna. Uh, good evening, everyone. I wanted to give you all an update as well as the uh, community on the mass notification system that we started uh, over the summer. As you know, uh, we started at the high school as well as the middle school. Um, we are actually um, complete at in terms of the, the high school, middle school, and Daniel Axford in terms of all of the wiring and all of the wall boxes uh, installed in all of the classrooms, all of the hallways, and obviously all of the uh, external locations as well as the courtyards that we designated. Uh, the issue in those three buildings, again, the high school, middle school, and Daniel Axford, uh, as well as the buildings that haven't been wired and the boxes installed yet, is the fact that the supply chain is holding back um, the actual d devices and equipment in terms of the strobes. So you'll see a strobe here for fire. The strobe for uh, the mass notification system is an, is an amber color, but it's very similar to what you see here for the fire system. Uh, we are waiting on all of those for the classrooms, for all of those buildings, and then some. Um, we've been told by Eagle Security, who is partnering, obviously, with the electric, uh, the electric company that is also uh, the winning bidder for this, uh, that these will start coming, arriving to the district in November sometime. So again, that's we're really eager, eagerly anticipating that. Um, in addition, though, the other buildings, as I mentioned, nothing has been completed yet. And so we need to uh, have these teams still come in um, from Eagle Security as well as the electric company and continue the installation, pulling the wires, uh, putting the boxes in the walls, not only in the hallways, but in the classrooms and other locations as well. Um, at the high school, I do want to mention, though, the system is operable. It's been operable since the beginning of school, uh, but it is operable to a certain degree. In other words, if there was an incident, it does work, and it, you know, you, you, we will be notifying the uh, central monitoring station, which is a 24-7 station, as well as, obviously, uh, the local sheriff's department, should something occur, would be notified should an insta incident occur. However, uh, it's still not fully operational according to how we see the system working um, at the high school. In other words, we don't have the strobes, once again, in all of the classrooms that needs to be done. Uh, we also have several panels uh, that need to be installed in our tech closets that are connected to the badge swipes. The badge swipes are key because, again, they're in certain locations throughout the building. Both staff and students will ultimately be able to swipe their badges and act the system. So again, these are the key components that we are currently waiting on. So again, I, I want to be very clear, this is something that we're, you know, taking extremely seriously, but unfortunately we're at the mercy as many other industries are in regards to card readers, chips, so on and so forth. Um, so again, I just wanted to get, give the board and the community an update on that. Um, and, um, and, and again, hopefully we will be receiving um, those devices and that equipment for this project sometime in November. So, is is that, Sam, is, yes. are the strobes in the hallways though, they are? They are. So they at, are at the, at, in the high school. That is correct. The, those are operable. So not only in the hallways, also on the, ex, uh, on the outside of the building, um, they're, they're working, as well as the courtyards, they are working. It is just the classrooms that I'm referencing at the high school that where they're not installed because we're waiting for them. And that's because also too, the speakers have, the, in the classrooms, it's much easier to hear. So we prioritize the hallways to make sure that correct. they were in the courtyards yards and outside of the, the building to make That's sure correct. we're done first. Good point. Yes, thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Heather? Yes. Heather? Um, you said something about a, a student would be able to badge themselves in to set it off. Correct. Yes, so what we did is we I purchased... a lot of problems coming from that. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we wanted to give the power to, to our kids as well. And when I, when I say that to the students at the high school... Well, um, any, any kid could do it? That's absolutely correct. That's what, we're, that's what we're aiming for. So how would we stop them from doing that... You know, I hate to say it, but like as a joke. Or no, as un a, I mean, understood. We're talking about high schoolers. I have two of them. So I, 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 I'm aware of their maturity. As I am too. I had two at the high school during the incident. I have uh, one there right now at the high so, school. Like so kind of wonder. <laughs> I know the maturity <laughs> level. Whatever. Think. Yeah. Oh, well, let's do this. Just like pulling a fire alarm or whatever. It does yes, happen. It does happen. And uh, frankly, the, we we obviously thought through this. Uh, we feel that putting a plastic cover over, um, and as well as a sign. 
uh, mentioning that this is only for emergencies only. Okay. But keep in mind that that HID reader is the student. It will be the student's ID. Right. And so therefore, okay. if someone does that, we know who does who did it. So that okay. is the bottom line. There's accountability there. Okay. So that's what we're really trying to to push with this going forward. Again, we're not there yet because yeah. we're waiting on the card. No, readers, I get it. I, I but, get it. Yeah. But that's a great question. Very good. Okay. Very good question. Okay. Anyone else? Anybody else? Mary. Thank you. So the uh, you said the other buildings um, still need to be wired. Is it just because we were working on the first? That's group, correct. And then we're continuing to move forward. That's correct. Um, so. That, it's a great question again. Yes, yeah, so we, you know, we were going hot and heavy on the high school, middle school, obviously, and then DA just happened to be next. Um, but what's going to happen is, is we're trying to do this work outside of the school hours. So, you know, second shift as well as holidays, weekends, and so that is why uh, the other schools have not been done because they, you know, obviously the, the high school is one of the largest high schools in the state. It's over 350,000 square feet, Oxford High School. So there was a lot of work performed. Obviously, the middle school is not a small building. So, but, but that's completed. And then DA is completed as well in terms of the wires being pulled and the boxes are on the walls throughout the building at DA. But again, the boxes are in the walls, but we just need the plug and play with the actual strokes. So. Okay. And with the, I'm sorry. Nope. Can I add a second? Of course. And with the, um, you said that the new badge reader systems for everybody's badges to work are, are part of the installation that's coming. That's, so we that's still great. have, um, we still have a way to start the um, system if needed. Yes, at the high school it can be activated. Right. Um, that right. is correct. The, right yes. at, at the, the central office location, uh, at the front office, it, it, it can be activated there. But going forward, it will be able to be activated um, at very key locations throughout the building in several wings, PAC, the natatorium. So there's several other areas throughout the building that will be able to you'll be able to activate it should an incident occur. Thank you. Chad. Thank you, Dan. Um, Sam, just two, two things come to mind. Sure. Um, training. I, I think what you're talking about, I like the idea of the kids being able to use it. I, I, I echo Heather's concern, so I think as we get closer, I would expect that the kids and the students, or I'm sorry, the students and the staff would get some level of training oh, so they know how it all works, right? A absolutely, and, and, and again, I understand that was a great question by Heather. You know, the last thing we want to do is re-traumatize any of our students and staff. And so I, I completely understand where, where Heather was going with that. Again, I, I have three, I have four children, three of them are teenagers, I get it. You know, there's a, sometimes a level of maturity there that sometimes you would wish was there and it's not. But uh, that being said, uh, uh, we really felt uh, as a team, as well as working with other experts, that that was really the way to go, you know. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, yeah. So, so the, the, other, the other item that I, would, that I, I jotted down is, is testing. I, we obviously we've got some time to plan this, but I'd really like to make sure, and I think you alluded to it already, but make sure that we're doing the testing of the system in our off hours on the weekends yes. or on the holidays so that there are no kids around to see it. Absolutely, and, and if there are, we, we communicate to the community uh, and let them know that this is when it's taking place, and again, please don't be no pun intended alarmed that you know something is going off at a specific time because we we do have to make, you know, maintain this testing to ensure they work so yes thank you sir. thank you very much Anybody else? Sam I have one question sure or actually a question and, and then a request you're only allowed one so go ahead. first my question is, is uh, in our contract do we have a uh, a date where they would commit to uh, having this done so or is it based on product availability? It's it's product availability, but there is a percentage of completion. So just like any other construction project, they're not getting paid completely until the, the job is done. Uh, so again, like any other construction project, we have an AIA document, which is their contract. So it's an architectural contract, and it's based upon percentage of completion. So, uh, you know, again, we am um, trying to recall if we do have a definitive deadline. I quite frankly don't believe we do, but they knew that our priority was the high school and the middle school to begin with. Uh, but again, you know, we will not pay until it is all complete. Okay. And my request would be that once it is all up and running, um, that any board member that would care to see it work, I would like to see it working. I, I don't want to, I, I want to see it with my own eyes. Mm -hmm. 
and I want to be able to report back that it is working the way that it was committed to us Absolutely. as a board. Absolutely. So what we'll do is, the, you know, obviously um, when all the buildings are, are ready or maybe even before that, um, we could obviously have the teams come in uh, from the organizations, the, the two vendors that obviously, uh, you know, accepted the winning bid that are doing the work. Uh, we can have a, a little show and tell uh, in off hours so that whoever wants to come and, and witness this, they can do that. Okay. Because um, again, I just don't want to re-traumatize people if, nope. if unnecessarily. So, okay. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Okay. Item number nine, human resources, Dr. Pass. Nothing this evening. Item number 10, safety and school operations. Items of school choice, I'm filling in for Ms. Luan on this. Uh, all of us at Cabinet are filling in for her position as we're quickly trying to move through uh, and begin the interviewing process over the next uh, couple of weeks uh, to fill both the school safety administrator position, we split her position into two. Um, and so we will have somebody with the, that is with the title of school safety administrator. Uh, that person will have more of a safety security background. And then uh, there will be an executive director of school operations who will probably have more of a, uh, a school background because there's the other part of the position that was over enrollment, school choice, um, the uh, food service, transportation, technology, they kind of handled the, the operations mm -hmm. of the school. So um, okay. we're beginning that process. In fact, the cabinet today, we started talking about it with Dr. Pass as far as uh, pulling the resumes and getting started on all that. We're gonna start with the safety, uh, school safety administrator first. And that hopefully next week is what we were setting up, early next week. Um, school of choice, we need to vote for second semester. I believe we have it up. Um, yeah, my old eyes can't see it either from there, but I think you have it uh, before you. Um, the dates, Mrs. Lamond did went over this last board meeting and it basically, uh, you just need to make a motion. Okay. Anybody care to make that motion? Mary? Move to approve the 2022-2023 school year, second semester slash trimester. Kindergarten through ninth grade, unlimited district wide, 10th, 11th, Oxford Virtual Academy Unlimited, full time students only. School of Choice enrollment will open November 4th, 2022, and close November 18, 2022, for seated elementary grade levels. Schools of Choice enrollment will open January 6, 2023 and close January 20, 2023 for seated secondary students. School of Choice enrollment will be open January 6, 2023 and close January 20, 2023 for grades K through 11 at Oxford Virtual Academy. Do I have support? Support Chad? Any discussion? I will say that this is a much more defined school of choice than what we've had in past years. Um, that school of choice window is narrowing for the groups of students, am I correct? Yes, well second semester we normally do narrow it down a little bit, because mm -hmm. usually parents are making their decisions on school of choice and, and that uh, during the summertime, spring, and so forth, uh, during second semester, uh, it's better to keep a tighter window uh, as well too, um, just for purposes of making sure that those, the, the parents are committed to that decision. All right. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Uh, we have some item number 11, scheduled activities. Um, there's no school on October 10th and 11th. Board of Education meetings are on, is um, October 11th at the high school and uh, also on October 25th at Clear Lake Elementary. Ken, any clarification? Yeah, I do want to address the incident, uh, the, the gun violence issue that happened at uh, Crossroads uh, yesterday. Uh, just to be clear and, and kind of, um, you know, 
in the email that we sent, we wanted to be clear that this incident happened about 5.30 at night. Now, I don't know if the people are familiar with Crossroads for Youth. There is an agency out there, uh, and there is a Crossroads uh, day school. Um, the agency, because it is located, uh, the agency is for adjudicated youth. Um, it is lo located in Oxford uh, Community Schools jurisdiction. Therefore, by state law, we have to supply the education to the youths that attend there. The youths that attend there are from all over the state of Michigan. Currently, I do not believe, I mean, occasionally a student may get assigned there from Oxford. Currently, there are none. Uh, the incident happened well after the school day. All of our employees were gone, um, and it involved the agency had a planned activity where an individual brought a visitor that they were not supposed to, um, and that's when the act, the incident happened. It wasn't, uh, you know, trying to be full, fully transparent. Same time, not violate people's privacy rights and so forth. Um, but that was, it did not involve Oxford uh, Community Schools employees or students. Um, it was involving the agency that was out there. It was quickly handled. Um, the only two people that were in the area, from what I understand, when the shot was fired into the air, was the person uh, and, the, and the parent that brought the individual. Uh, they went into lockdown. They were then, uh, the, the agency did. Uh, it was on their campus. If you've ever been out there, there's many buildings out there, as you may recall, from having been out there. Um, it was not anywhere near the school or on the school part of the, the campus. Uh, they contained the, the situation. O uh, Oakland County Sheriffs were called. Uh, the individuals were taken into custody at that point, and the situation was contained. But I just wanted to be clear um, that you know it did not involve Oxford Community Schools in that regard, other than the fact that, like I say, we have a school out there for about 25, 30 kids that we man out there because we are required by state law to educate the kids that reside at that youth agency. So, kind of clarify that. Can help me get a better perspective. I've been out there, and I think Heather's been out there a number of times, and I think every board member's been out there. It was it at the facility that's across the street from where the school was at, or on this on that side of Drainer? It was on that. It was on the side where most of their because they sold most of the, the south south of Drainer. Okay. It was on the side the campus, which is quite large, and they separate the male and female students into different classes. Correct. And so, from what I understand from Guy, it was somewhat near the campus, but not on the campus of the, the school. It's one okay. big campus, I should say. I shouldn't say campus. It wasn't in the school, from what I understand, or it, it was actually outside, but it wasn't directly near the school, from Mrs. Mr. Colton's side. And will we be updated as a school, the outcomes of what the resource officer investigated, like, or what types of discipline will be? We'll there was back. no discipline for the child, the, 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 for any child or anything out there. And this individual is not a Crossroads, Oxford's Crossroads for Youth Agency. Sorry, the titles are kind of very close to Oxford Crossroads Day School. So I get them back and forth a little bit. The person, the individual that fired the shot is not an employee, Is was not supposed to be there, and will face whatever consequences the law deems okay. and the attorney Okay. The Oakland County Prosecutor determines. All right. Okay. Hopefully, I did. I cleared that up. Yep. Final board comments. Anybody? Okay. We have. Uh, we will be going in closed session. So, who would like to read that? Ms. Schaefer. Yeah. Move to meet in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act, Section 8E, for the purpose of consulting with its attorneys regarding trial strategies in connection with case numbers 21CV12871, 21CV10407, 21CV10805, 21CV1113. Excuse me, Heather, those oh, are 22. Oh, sorry, 22, the last, yeah. Yes. Sorry, 22. Um, the last three I read, I'm sorry, were 22. 22CV11. 
250, 22 CB 11 360, 22 CB 11 250, 22 11 398, 22 11 448, 22 19 22 62, 22 19 48 91, and 22 19 56 63. And section 8H to consider material exempt from discussion or disclosure by state or federal statute. Attorney client privilege written opinion. Do I have support? Support, Mr. Griffith. Any discussion? Roll call vote, Mary. Ms. Schaefer? Yes. Mr. D'Alessandro? Yes. Mr. Foster? Yes. Ms. Hanser? Yes. Mr. Griffith? Yes. Okay. Uh, we, you are more than welcome to stay. Uh, we are going to break into another room, I believe, and then we'll return here. Okay, we're out of closed session at 9.55. Anything under other, Ken? Nothing tonight. Okay, with that, meeting adjourned.